attacker was, Alexander. But the police didn't care. In fact, they told both of these victims that they needed to drop the charges and leave them alone. And if they didn't, they, the police, would come up with something to have both of them arrested, the victims. And so Alexander got away. See, that's why you don't go to the fucking police, bro. They don't care as long as it, until it happens to them, bro. If two people come to you and tell you that somebody's trying to kill them and you say you, you dismiss their charges, that should, that should tell you a lot about them. <laughs> Yo, what's good? What's going on, YouTube? It's your boy, Kwan and Sibi on. Back when I knew a fucking reaction video. Ooh, 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 ooh. ooh, you know what I'm saying? Today's one going to be reacting to Mr. Bowler, Russia's most feared criminal, true audience only, you know what I'm saying? I ain't did a reaction video almost over a week. Cause it's crazy that I, I, I posted a motivation video yesterday, you know what I'm saying? I should go check that out if y'all need like motivation and stuff. I'll be doing like little motivation videos, you know what I'm saying? But um, yeah, man. Welcome back to the video, you know what I'm saying? If you'd like to give a thumbs up, we're gonna give a thumbs down. Can't know why. I mean, okay, just the tool, you know what I'm saying? Shout out to the person that told me to be at to, or the people who told me to be at to. Shout out to y'all, shout out to y'all, shout out to you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, let's get straight into this video. Let's get it. All right. Today's story sounds exactly like an urban legend. It sounds too exaggerated, too grotesque, too terrifying to be real, but it is. This is the true story of the Pitsevki Park Maniac. But before we get into today's story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do, and we upload once or twice every week. So if that's of interest to you, please offer to help build the like button's new dresser they just got from <laughs> Ikea, and as soon as you open it up, immediately find I like the all the screws, as well. strip them all, and then leave. And also, PS. please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's story. The phenomenon. Moscow, Russia, which is one of the world's richest cities, is home to more billionaires than any other European city. But if you travel just 10 miles south of Moscow's richest neighborhood, the gold. I thought Rush, Russia was in Asia. mile, you will reach one of Russia's poorest neighborhoods, the southern Moscow suburbs. Nicknamed Zhopamira, which means the soul of the world, these suburbs used to be a thriving neighborhood with tens of thousands of working class Russians and their families calling it their home. But after the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, yeah. the money and the jobs in this area dried up completely. I think the Soviet and even Union though for 20 years, I think. wanted to relocate and live somewhere with more opportunity, they couldn't. They didn't have the resources to leave, and so they were trapped. And since 1991, really nothing has changed in these suburbs. Today, there are still tens of thousands of now very poor Russian families that still live there, living in these totally overcrowded Soviet apartment buildings that are these big, square, identical-looking things that are literally falling apart. And most of the people who live in these suburbs either are unemployed or they work some dead-end job that barely pays them any money. The police in the suburbs are completely underfunded and, for the most part, are corrupt. And so crime over the years has really taken a dramatic uptick. Also, drug and alcohol abuse are completely that right. shows that the, uh, the government or whoever is over them doesn't really care for them they just want them to destroy themselves and just, they don't care bro it's so crazy though man it's, it's literally in this world it's rich versus poor and a lot of people don't even see that it's bigger than racism it's it's it's, it's rich versus poor and evil versus I'm good, you know what I'm saying? It's way bigger than race, bro. Because some, like, some people's own people would be going against them. 
That should be crazy. Because a lot of people be so desperate to get something. You know what I'm saying? Let's watch this video. Rampant in this part of the world. But despite their notoriously rough living situation in the southern Moscow suburbs, these residents do have one claim to fame, and that is the Vitsevsky Park. Vitsevsky Park is comprised primarily of a massive, lush green forest it that is beautiful. full of wildlife and beautiful streams and clearings, yeah. and it sits right on the southern edge of the southern Moscow suburbs. In total, the park covers a whopping 2,700 acres and stretches four miles from top to bottom, which makes it three times bigger than New York City's famous Central Park. Vitsevsky Park had always been a popular tourist destination for people living around Moscow, but after the fall of the Soviet Union, the park's popularity skyrocketed specifically amongst people that lived in the southern Moscow suburbs. As their lives continued to become more bleak in the 1990s, they compensated by going to the park as much as they possibly could. They would take long walks in the woods, they would play chess with their friends along the peripheries on the park benches and tables, or they'd go cross-country skiing in the winter. Basically, year-round, this park became their escape from their miserable everyday lives. Yeah. But that would not last. Starting Nation. in the early 2000s, something totally unexplainable and terrifying began happening in the park, specifically in the heavily forested area in the park. And eventually, this thing, this unusual event that was taking place, got so completely out of hand that the residents of the southern Moscow suburbs stopped going in the park. They were literally too scared to go inside. The strange phenomenon began in 2001. From May to July that year, Study songwriting online with Berkeley's renowned faculty. Download your free songwriting handbook now and... Ten people went missing after having been spotted either in or right around the outside of the heavily forested area inside of Pitsemsky Park. All of them were alone when they were last spotted, and all of them were men. Now, there was some precedent for people suddenly going missing in this part of Russia. Every now and again, people would try to flee these suburbs to try to make a better life for themselves somewhere else. But time and time again, they would just come back a couple of days or weeks later because it hadn't worked out. But when these 10 men did not come back in a couple of days or weeks, their families went to police and reported them missing. But unsurprisingly, the police did not launch an investigation. Instead, they accused the 10 missing men of just being drunk bums who probably wandered off somewhere and whatever trouble they were in. You know what's so funny, though? That's what they all say when somebody come up missing and shit, bro. They don't, they don't care, bro. They just, they rock they, they purpose to, they, the police... It's crazy though, you can't go to police for help anymore, bro. Cause they always have to make up excuses. Oh, that person is drunk. Oh, that person is how pure, he'll be back. No, bro. That's the, that's about this video. It was their fault. Now, the families and fault. the locals did not buy this explanation, right. but there really wasn't a better explanation. These men really had just kind of vanished. No one had any idea where they went. And so given the kind of general grim outlook on life that lots of people held in this area, Same people, people just kind of accepted that whatever happened to these 10 men happened and there's nothing any of us can do about it. And they moved on. But in October she of cried. that year, so two months after the 10th man had gone missing in the park, another man went missing in the park. And then by the end of the year, four more men had vanished inside of the park. And all of them vanished under the same circumstances, last spotted alone in or around the heavily forested area in the park. The families of these five men would go to police. They would report their family members missing. But again, the police did not launch any investigation and blamed the missing people for being responsible for whatever happened to them. And then after that, the families... Kind but of imagine if there was one eight family members. Five men not really sure what to make of it and locals kind of gossiped about it for a little while and started to speculate about what might have happened to them and kind of lumped them in with the 10 other men that had gone missing but after a while when no new news came out about what happened to them 
everyone just kind of moved on again. And unbelievably, this pattern would repeat itself for nearly four years. From 2002 to late 2005, 25 more people would go missing inside of Pitsetsky Park. 24 of them would be men, one of them would be a woman, although it wasn't clear if she was actually in the same category as the other 24 men, but regardless, that put the total number of mysterious disappearances inside of this forested area in the park up to 40. But still, the police... But it's, it so cr it's so crazy though, like, the pattern keep, co keep coming up, all men coming up missing in the same area, but y'all don't think... Not, nothing is fishy going on with that. People just, people, some people just need to. Oh, they they put making the wrong people policemen and police women. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's a fucking word. <laughs> and eventually, so too did the local population. Everyone just kind of moved on, like this phenomenon wasn't happening. Right. People were so, not going okay. missing in droves inside of this forest, but everything would change with missing person number 41 because unlike the previous 40 this missing person would be found again 63 year old nikolai zakarchenko was a retired police officer who lived in a tiny apartment in the southern moscow suburbs with his family he was a classic russian tough guy who chain smoked cigarettes and drank lots of vodka and even though he was well aware of the missing person phenomenon inside of this park that wasn't about to stop him from doing the thing he loved, which was going on walks inside of this park. He figured whatever was out there, he could handle it. So one evening in November of 2005, Nikolai told his sister that he was going to go out for a walk in the park. But that night, he didn't come back. And so his family was very worried about him, but they decided they would wait until the next morning to see if maybe he showed up. But the following morning, when Nikolai did not show up, his family went to the police. But per usual, the police did nothing. A few days later, a local was walking fairly deep inside of the forest inside of Bitsevsky Park when they noticed well off the trail, off to the left side, there was something unusual kind of tucked in the underbrush. Now, this local was all alone. They had kind of a bad feeling about whatever this was. And so they called the police and they reported seeing something strange. And surprisingly, the police did actually come out and they went over to investigate and they found this unusual thing was Nikolai Zakarchenko. He was lying face down, he was fully clothed, and he only had one injury, but it obviously had been fatal. He had a massive hole on the back of his head. This was not from a gunshot. This was from massive blunt force trauma. He had been struck so hard that literally the back half of his skull was blown clear off. The police searched the area in hopes they what might the find you, weapon or some other clue as to what happened to him, but there was nothing. And so all the police could deduce was that Nikolai had obviously been attacked either by a person or group of people or even an animal, and that whoever his attacker was or whatever his attacker was had clearly snuck up on him given the location of his injury. Now that the police had a body and it likely looked like it was a murder, they could no longer longer ignore the fact that so many people had gone missing inside of this park and it was looking like probably if they looked around the park they might find more bodies Duh. so the local police called in reinforcements from russia's criminal investigation department and they came to the southern moscow suburbs and with the local police they began searching every inch of this park looking for more bodies or just for any indication of who or what was behind this attack and behind all these missing people but after several days of a very extensive search where they looked everywhere in this park all over the forest. Everybody could be their body is fucking bones now bro their body is fucking decomposed bro area they found nothing at it's the decomposed. same time this huge police search was Don't going down for real. inside of Bitsevsky Park news about Nikolai's death had spread amongst the southern Moscow suburbs and people were now getting really scared before the fear of the park felt kind of theoretical because there were no bodies and so even though it seemed far-fetched it did seem possible that maybe all these people were getting lost on their own that they really were just drunks stumbling off 
But now, with the discovery that one of these missing people had been horrifically killed, that made the danger associated with this park feel very real. And so it was around this time that most residents of these suburbs stopped going inside of this park in fear of whatever was out there in the forest. And they would forbid their children from going in, and they would tell their neighbors, don't go in the park. And they gave this evil thing that lurked in the forest that caused men to disappear and attack Nikolai, they gave this thing a name. They called it the Bitsevsky Park Maniac. But despite the fear of this maniac causing so many people to avoid this park, and despite the massive police presence that was in the park constantly looking for bodies, looking for clues, and just generally patrolling the area, despite all that, people still continued to go missing in this park. Starting just a week after the discovery of Nikolai's body in November of 2005, all the way up to April of 2006, nine more men would mysteriously vanish in the forested section of the too damn hard here. And just like Nikolai, just a couple of days after they were reported missing by their families, they would be found lying out in the middle of the park with the backs of their heads caved in. But unlike Nikolai, most of these nine victims had been found with a glass bottle jammed into the hole in the back of their head. Meaning almost certainly this was the work of a human, not some animal. Exactly. By this point, almost no one was stepping foot inside of the park because it was basically common knowledge that, you know, a serial killer is obviously on the loose in the forest. But despite this, there were still some very stubborn people who continued to go inside of the park. Man, come on now. I've been so stubborn. Oh my God. They don't get the fuck a memo until it happens to them. Oh, it's fake. Oh, it's fake. I like, that's why a lot of people, that's why that's what's fucking wrong with a lot of people. Dude. They too damn hard headed. He said it. Hard headed, bro. You see now all this shit, all these people coming up missing. You stick a tingle, carry your ass up in that motherfucker. That mean you don't care for your motherfucking life and your damn safety, bro. People too damn bullheaded. And one of those people was 32-year-old Alexander Bachushkin. He had been born in the southern Moscow suburbs, and he still lived with his family in the same tiny apartment he had grown up in. It's safe to say Alexander's life had been more difficult than his peers. When he was just four years old, he fell backwards off of a swing, and when he sat up, he was okay, but the swing came swinging back and smashed him in the front of the head, causing brain damage. Ooh. Now, his family did not have the money to send him to a hospital, and so when he stood up after getting struck and he was kind of able to walk around and he seemed okay, they determined he was fine and they didn't follow up. But Alexander was not fine. The injury had impaired his cognitive abilities, and years later, when he went to school, the other kids would bully him for sounding dumb. By the time Man. Alexander was in high school, he felt like an outcast. He didn't have any friends, and he was miserable. But his grandfather, who lived in the same apartment complex as he did, he noticed this about Alexander, and he decided he would take him under his wing and he would look after him. And so the first thing he did is he asked Alexander to come over, and he taught him how to play chess, believing that would be something they could bond over. And when he taught Alexander the rules of this game, which are quite complicated, you it was real like life. it opened up a secret portion of Alexander's brain mm -hmm. that had never been opened before. Alexander immediately absorbed all this information about chess and became a master of it practically overnight. Within a couple of days of being taught how to play, he was beating his grandfather virtually every time they played. They so him. his grandfather was totally thrilled about this and was very proud of Alexander. And so he decided to bring Alexander down to Bitsevsky Park where all these old men who were total chess masters were always playing chess on all of the park benches and tables. And so he brought Alexander down there and he put him up against all of these incredible players and very quickly, Alexander was wiping the floor with them, and they loved him for it. He was their star. He was their prodigy. They totally adored him, and they respected him. And when they found out he was getting bullied at school, they made a point of telling him that he would always have a place with them in this park. And so for Alexander, mm. this was like the best moment of his life. Mm. He finally felt like he was accepted, and he finally felt happy. And so over the years, even after Alexander's grandfather passed away, Alexander continued to go down to Bitsevsky Park to play chess virtually every day. And he kept going to the park to play chess, 
even when men began going missing in the park, including some of the men he played chess with. And Alexander continued going to the park to play even chess, after no. even after bodies began piling up in the park. Alexander's mother was terrified for him and felt like he didn't understand the risk he was putting himself in by going to this park all the time. But his mom just don't know why he probably, he probably was the killer. But let me stop them. Don't, don't let me judge too quick. Don't, don't let me judge too quick. Let's watch the video. Time she pleaded with him not to go, just take one day off from playing chess. Alexander would say, Mom, I'm going to be fine. He's the one I killed him. Please. Leave anyways. That's my In prediction. April of 2006, Alexander was 32 years old and worked for a local grocery store stocking shelves. By this point, at least 50 people had vanished mysteriously in the forested section of the park and 10 bodies had been found. On the morning of the 12th of that month, Alexander showed up to the grocery store for his shift and right away he noticed there was a new employee. It was this beautiful older woman he had never seen before and Alexander, while he was confident playing chess, was not remotely confident around women. He had never had a girlfriend before. Mm. But he found himself looking at this woman across the store, feeling like she was different, that she was more approachable than other women. And so he told himself that day he was going to go up to her and he was going to say hi. And so all through his shift, he kind of awkwardly watched this woman from a distance, kind of building up his confidence. And then at the end of his shift, her shift was also ending, the pair walked outside at the same time. And Alexander was about to say something, but he just couldn't find his voice. And then he noticed this woman had put a cigarette in her mouth, but she was fishing around for her lighter like she couldn't find it. And so Alexander jumped into action and pulled his own lighter out and he held it out to her and said, hey, can I light your cigarette? And so before long, the two were chatting and they were walking together and smoking their cigarettes. And over the course of their conversation, Alexander would learn this woman was named Larissa Collegina, and she was 48 years old, and she lived near Alexander's apartment. And so after they walked for a little while, they arrived in front of her apartment building, and at this point, Alexander knows she's about to go inside, and so he suddenly feels bold, and he asks Larissa, hey, do you want to continue walking around with me for a bit and maybe do a pass through the park. Now, at this point, the Pitsevsky Park was totally not a place you would bring people to. This is a place that everyone in the area is basically terrified of. Kill. But for Alexander, Pitsevsky Park was like his happy place. And so naturally- I feel like he, she, she for the uh, deny him, he for the kill her ass. Cause anybody, anybody who got mental issues, if you rejected them, they would they would they would go they would get mental to the strength where they want to kill you because they can't control that that uh that emotion like I'm gonna kill this motherfucker because he did have injuries like once she had like a brain injury it fuck with your brain and shit you know what I'm saying you can't control that that the energy so that it makes you so angry it makes you want to kill her he probably she probably rejected him that's what that's what I feel like it's going because she probably rejected him he probably killed her in the park that's. That's why I'm, that's why I'm going to get him from this. If he's going to take a woman on a date, that's where he's going to bring her. And surprisingly, Larissa was very quick to say, oh, let's go. Let's go to the park. And so the two, they lit up another cigarette and they walked across the road and they walked through the front gates of the park. Their first stop was the chess tables along the periphery of the park right outside of the forest. And the tables were totally empty. But at this point, that wasn't surprising given the fact that even amongst diehard chess players, Really, Alexander was the only one still willing to go back in there every single day. Even when they so after seeing where Alexander spent all of his time, it seemed like it was time to turn around and leave. But neither Alexander nor Larissa wanted their date to end. And so they decided to light up another cigarette and then follow a walking path that kind of looped into the forest and came back out again. And as they entered the woods and got deeper and deeper into the forest, the chess tables that were behind them faded from view and the sky began to get darker and darker as it was getting late. But the pair just kept on walking, maintaining their cheerful conversation. But at some point, as they talked and walked, the path below their feet stopped looking like the path they had originally set out on. Now they're stepping over broken logs, and they're ducking under low hanging branches, and it's not really clear if they're on a marked trail anymore. Mm. But neither of them bring it up. They just maintain their kind of light conversation and continue walking as if nothing's going on. However, they both definitely began walking faster and faster to maybe speed up this loop. But at some point when it was very obvious they were no longer on a path, 
They both came to a stop. As they had walked, Alexander had been in front. And so when they came to a stop, he turned around and he looked at Larissa and right away he... Ooh, you right about what? Purdue University Global. Apply now at purdueglobal.edu. Claritin relieves symptoms from over 200 indoor and outdoor allergens day after day. Live Claritin clear. He could tell there was just something wrong about her. There was a look on her face that just didn't look right. She looked exhausted or sad or something. And then as he's looking at her, she inexplicably kind of collapses into a tree right next to her. And she grabs the tree with her arms and she slides down to its base and she presses her cheek she and her killed. chest up against its bark and she begins to cry. Alexander has no idea what's going on, so he just stands there staring at her. And in between sobs, Larissa looks up at Alexander and says, you're the maniac, aren't you? Alexander couldn't believe it. She was the first person to figure it out so quickly. Normally, he... I told y'all. I told y'all he was the motherfucking killer. Cause he looked like he looked like it. Cause he's the only one that's keep going back and forth with this shit and, and, and the brain injuries. But it's obvious that he was the fucking killer. You have to tell his victims before you kill them. And so he smirked and he looked at her and he said, "Yes, I am." And so Larissa, at this point, she lets out this huge sob and she looks down and she keeps crying. And then she looks back up again at him and she says, are you going to kill me? And without any hesitation, Alexander looks at her and says, yes, I am. And then he reached into his jacket and he pulled out a hammer. No one knows for sure why Alexander became a serial killer or why he almost injuries. exclusively targeted men. Many people believe it might have something to do with the brain damage he suffered as a four-year-old yeah. when that swing hit him in the head. Yeah. And somehow That's that rewired his brain, mm -hmm. made him more aggressive towards That's other what... people, especially men. Yeah. But that's just speculation. And other than that injury, there really isn't much in Alexander's life that stands out as a big red flag. He just that, kind of that, floated that about his life and followed the crowd. But in 1992, when he was 18 years old, he got this urge to kill and he actually decided to act on it. He brought up this desire to a classmate of his named Mikhail Odachuk. And surprisingly, Mikhail says to Alexander, I want to kill someone too. Let's do it together. And so the two met up a couple of days later and they headed off to Bitsevsky Park and began walking around the forest looking for a lone person that could be their victim. And as they're walking along, Alexander, he's fully committed, but he can tell Mikhail is not. He's starting to get cold feet and he's talking about, you know, maybe let's, let's stop for now and head back and maybe do this another time. And Alexander, he's getting more and more angry and frustrated with Mikhail until finally Alexander decides... He killed my first victim will be Mikhail. And so he turns to Mikhail and he says, Wow, that's what I'm you gotta be careful what you say to people. Like, with me, I go off vast, bro. Your, your vibe is weird. I'm not fucking with you. Hell no. <laughs> my, like, it's like my, my, my body is telling me something that I don't know, that, that it know, but I don't know. You gotta be careful with some of these people, bro. Some people, some people, evil. What? If you wanna head back, you can. Kyle says, okay, you know, maybe we can do this another time, right? And Alexander says, sure. And so Mikhail turns around, and as soon as his back is to Alexander, Alexander pulls out his hammer, and he smashes Mikhail in the back of the skull, causing Mikhail to crumble to the ground, either dead or unconscious. But either way, he's laying on the ground. And as soon as he is, Alexander remembers that they had passed a little while earlier this well kind of hidden in the middle wow. of the forest. And so he grabbed Mikhail's body and he dragged him through the forest over to this well. And when he got to the well, he pulled the lid off of it and then he picked Mikhail's body up, pushed him up and over the edge and dropped him inside. And Mikhail fell 30 feet all the way down to the icy water below. And then Alexander put the lid back on the well Grabbed his hammer off the ground. I feel like that's probably where all the other victims is at too. That's why that body was never found. Hmm, damn. You watched this video. And he left. 
An important part of Alexander's killing was this well. This well was not a drinking water well. It was basically an access point to this deep underground sewer system that stretched all around the underside of this park. And so when Mikhail fell down this 30 foot shaft, he didn't just land at a pit of water right at the bottom of the well. Instead, he fell all the way down the shaft until it opened up like the bottom of a huge scientific beaker. It was basically like this big cave at the bottom of the well that was full of very deep water. And so Mikhail would have splashed into that water, which was icy cold. And then after Alexander put the lid on top of the well, it would have been pitch black inside of that space. Now, even if it had been lit up, there was no ladder for Mikhail to climb back out of. And there was a current running through this well because there were tunnels leading into it and then out the other side. And so Mikhail, if he woke up, if he was conscious when he hit the water, he would have immediately been swept into another tunnel. And many of the other tunnels that led away from this cave space were completely filled with water. And so he would have had nowhere to breathe. He would have been sucked into a tunnel and he would have drowned. And so whether Mikhail died from the strike on the back of the head or whether he drowned, we don't know, but he died after being thrown in the well. And then his body was swept miles and miles away to some deep underwater recess where nobody was looking. Mm -hmm. Alexander would wait another nine years before he killed again. But once he started up again, he didn't stop. His first kill after the hiatus was in the summer of 2001. His victim was a man he liked to play chess with. In fact, this was a man that loved Alexander and was definitely one of Alexander's friends. They regularly played wow. chess with each other. And one day in May, after a game of chess, Alexander asked the man if he wanted to head into the forest to pay respects to his dog, who he had buried out in this forest. And he told the man he was going to have a sip of vodka over his dog's grave. And so this chess friend of his agrees to go with Alexander because he loves Alexander. He's a good friend of his and says, absolutely, let's go pay our respects to your dog. And so the pair begin walking into the forest. And at first they're on a trail. But eventually Alexander says to this man that you need to leave the trail in order to get to the gravesite. So the man says, yeah, no problem. And so they get off the trail and they're walking for a little while until they reach the well. And when they get to the well, Alexander stops and he kind of points to some arbitrary sometimes spot. You gotta be, sometimes you got to be careful who, who, you, who you be cool with because you never know what their intentions might be, bro. You could love somebody. You'd be the one that love the one that you love the most, be the one that hurts you the most, too. It's a lesson right here, bro. Watch this video. On the ground and says, oh, that's, that's where my dog was buried. And so Alexander pulls out a bottle of vodka and he takes a swig and then he hands it to the man who does the same thing to kind of do this commemorative drink for this dog. And then afterwards, you know, dog Alexander right looks at his friend and kind of gestures with his arm to get the man to, you know, take them back out of the forest, back out to the chess tables. And so the man turns around and begins backtracking. And as soon as he does, and his back is to Alexander, Alexander pulls out his hammer, he walks up behind his friend, and he smashes him over the back of the head. And then just like Mikhail, he drags this man's body over to the edge of the well, he pulls the lid of the well off, and then he lifts this man up, and he dumps him into the well shaft, and then he puts the lid back on top. Alexander- Did I just say that, bro? That's what he did to all his fucking victims. That's why they, they, That's why. The victim was never found. The the, the first, how many victims it was? 25 victims. That's why their body was never found, because their body's in that damn well somewhere, bro. Shit, he's, he's smart, though. Watch the video. Continued to lure his victims out to that well, and all of his victims were people he knew. Mm. They were his chess friends. Mm. They were his neighbors in mm. his apartment complex. They were anyone he had a personal relationship with. He would later say that that was his preferred victim. He liked to know the person he was killing. It made him feel like God. Amazingly, it would turn out not all of Alexander's victims who were chucked into that well actually died. Victims number 16 and 17 
Jane, who were a pregnant woman and a 13-year-old boy, respectively. After they had their heads smashed with a hammer and they got chucked into the well, their clothing got caught on a snag poking out of the inside of that 30-foot shaft, and it literally arrested their fall and kept them from plummeting all the way into the water. And somehow, in both instances, Alexander didn't notice. He just put the well lid back on and walked away, believing they were both dead. But they weren't, and after they regained consciousness, they were able to kind of claw their way back up the well shaft and pulled themselves out of the well. Both victims would go to the police and both of them would positively identify who their attacker was, Alexander. But the police didn't care. In fact, they told both of these victims that they needed to drop the charges and leave them alone. And if they didn't, they, the police, would come up with something to have both of them arrested, the victims. And so Alexander got away. See, that's why you don't go to the fucking police, bro. They don't care as long as it, until it happens to them, bro. If two people come to you and tell you that somebody's trying to kill them and you say you, you dismiss their charges, that should, that should tell you a lot about them. Let's watch this video. With it, and the victims were literally intimidated by the police to stay quiet. And so that led to dozens and dozens more murders. In April of 2006, after Alexander told Larissa he was the maniac and he was going to kill her, he walked behind her as she cried and continued to hold onto the tree and he wound up his hammer and brought it smashing into the back of her head. And then as she slumped to the ground, he hit her several more times in the back of the head with the hammer, and then he pulled out a vodka bottle and he jammed it inside of the hole, and then he left. Two months later, Alexander would lure another woman out into the middle of the forest with him. Her name was Marina, she was 35 years old, she was and she had met Alexander while working at the grocery store with him. She actually was hired to work at the grocery store to fill Larissa's now vacant spot. Before Alexander and Marina began their walk out to the park, which was Alexander's suggestion, real Marina now. said she just needed to stop by her apartment to let her son know where she was going. And so they swung by her apartment, Marina went upstairs, and she left a note for her teenage son saying where she was going and who she would be with. And she even left behind Alexander's name and his phone number on this note. And so when she came back out again and she and Alexander began walking towards the park, Alexander knew that if he killed her, which was his intention, that he would certainly be caught. The police were on super high alert at this point, and they would certainly get their hands on this note, and that would absolutely implicate him. And so he didn't really know what to do. Right. But by the time they were strolling into the forest, Alexander had decided he was going to kill her anyways. And many people believe he did this specifically to get caught, not to protect the public from himself, but because he wanted fame, he wanted recognition for what he had done. This theory stems from the fact that starting with his 41st victim, Nikolai Zakharchenko, Alexander began leaving his victim's bodies out in the open. He stopped putting them into that well. And he wouldn't just leave them out in the open. He would prop them up in strange poses against trees, and he would jam glass bottles into the holes in the back yeah, of the heads, indicating he wanted the police to find them. That way, he could get all the credit it, he believed he deserved. When the police did finally yeah. arrest Alexander, they searched his apartment and they found this notebook. And in this notebook was a picture of a chessboard. Now a chessboard has 64 squares on it. And in Alexander's notebook, this chess- So his goal was to kill 64 people. How many people say 60? How many, how many people? How many? Well, no, well, how many numbers? How, what? How, how many numbers? It is on that on that on that chessboard. That's how many people that he that he planned to kill. He was on his forty first victim. He, he only had like twenty more people to kill. Then he was gonna turn turn himself in and shit. Damn, that's crazy had 62 of the 64 squares yeah. filled in and Alexander would explain to police that that was his scorecard he had 62 victims it would turn out two of that. those people had actually survived the that. pregnant woman and the 13 year old boy but still there were 60 murders accounted for in this notebook 
Alexander would be fully cooperative with police and would tell them every detail he could possibly it's remember like a game about every him. single killing, including what conversations were like with the person he killed right before he killed them. He would also often reenact what he did to the person and how he felt afterwards. It was very clear that Alexander was reveling in the attention he was getting from law enforcement, and it was very clear that he loved talking he about like that. Ultimately, the police were only able to gather enough evidence to charge Alexander with 49 murders, not 60. And when Alexander heard this, he was totally disappointed and he asked the judge if he could get credit for the other 11 murders to maintain his 60 victim mark. The judge said no. During his trial, Alexander was deemed to be such a threat, he was kept inside of a glass cage the entire time. And during the proceedings, he showed no remorse and in fact seemed kind of happy like he was enjoying the spectacle of his trial it's like a game he was to him. given the harshest penalty under russian law at the time which was life in prison without parole and the first 15 years of his life sentence would be in complete and total solitary confinement so virtually no human interaction kept inside of a cell 24 hours a day mm. with nothing in his cell all day long Alexander is still alive today and he is still in solitary confinement. So that's going to do it, guys. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, please offer to help build the like button's new draft. I, I, like, I like how you were saying that. I like how you were saying that shit. You know what I'm saying? It's fun. Um, but yeah, man. That shit crazy as hell, bro. It was like a game to him, bro. It was like a fucking game to him. So, he looked at it like he was God and shit. And he playing the game with chess with people alive and shit. All because of one injury that happened to him when he was a little boy. That one injury changed his life forever. That shit crazy, bro. But, um, yeah, man. Glad to forget with thumbs up. You don't give a thumbs down. I kind of why. We don't care just at all, you know what I'm saying? Yes, subscribe. See you guys in this video. I love y'all.